Hello, and welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe. Uh, both those of you listening on the podcast and watching on the video, uh, we have a, uh, a special edition this week. It's special in the sense that it's kind of long, and I have printed here in my hand the written DividendCafe.com because I say it all the time and never do it, but I'm like determined to let you listeners get the full enchilada this week of everything I talk about in the written commentary. Uh, it's also special because it's Father's Day weekend, and, and I won't uh, repeat or rehash all the sentiments of the uh, commentary up to this effect, uh, other than to just say that I do wish all of you dads happy Father's Day, and and I think that it's one of those, uh, you know, two-way uh, holidays and how we take it, uh, you know, because we we have our own dads to honor, and then many of us are dads, and so uh, there's that that uh, you know connection with our own kids, and then connection with the generation above, and and uh, and the comment I was I was focusing on was how you know I'm just so used to watching golf on Father's Day weekend, and that U.S. Open being Sunday, and and so you know the U.S. Open's not here this year. Oftentimes the NBA Finals has been running through Father's Day weekend, and that's not here. And and yet both of those things are coming back. And uh, yet you know my own father has been passed away 25 years now uh, is not. And and I think that there's this sort of um, reflection, you know, that's always healthy, particularly for those, which I think is most of you, uh, but in, in my case, certainly very blessed to have had a wonderful relationship with my dad, and and so it's a good weekend to, to reflect and be grateful, and in the and and also grateful, you know, for being a father and 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 the kids that that I'm trying to bring up, and and so. Hopefully, we uh, do have things to look forward to out of this Father's Day weekend. We are uh, already, over the last several weeks, we're experiencing the joys of an economy that is uh, beginning to reopen certain pockets of the country, more so than others, and certain areas within those pockets, more so than others. But um, we can feel it coming, and, and it's it's good, and, and we'll hopefully we'll continue. Yeah, apart from the investor impact, apart from the economic impact, just some return to normalcy and some return to the, the things in our life that we often take for granted. And so here we are, and, and the Dividend Cafe this week is going to go through a lot of things that I think are pertinent. There actually is a whole section I'm going to talk about regarding the state of the economy and some of the data that's out there. And I want to try to turn or pivot a little bit into what I think is a particular area that is not as headline uh, oriented, not as media savvy. Uh, media and savvy these days don't belong in the same sentence, but it's not noteworthy to the media because it isn't a real headline grabbing kind of a category. But I'm going to talk about that in a moment, so I'll hold you in suspense. You know, first and foremost, I think one of the things going on in the market right now, the market was up. Most days this week, I'm recording the middle of the day Friday, uh, Friday, and we were up 300 points, then we went down 200 points, and then as I'm recording, we're flat, and we were up um, you know, a pretty fair amount most days coming into this week. Uh, a lot of it uh, was triggered by uh, being down 800 points Monday and then closing up 200, so you have this 1,000-point reversal. and. So as we sit, let's say we're going to end up the the week uh, up somewhere between five hundred and a thousand points, something like that. You know, it's a it's a big week, uh, particularly from that low spot Monday. Last week was down over a thousand points. It had a, a particularly horrific day in the middle of it, um, and the week before was up. You know, huge. So we have this volatility still, and I talk about all the time. But one of the things where, if you want to think about the environment we're in right now, as that we're in low volatility, high volatility, you know, good opportunity, bad opportunity, whatever you think is happening in the market, I will promise you that, that someone can sit down and tell you a bunch of reasons to be out of equities, and that are going to be right in the sense that there's these bad things one has to be concerned about. And someone could sit here and make a case to you, oh, you want to be in equities, and they're going to be right. I, I mean, they may make bad arguments to make it, but there are good arguments. You know, right now, one could certainly argue we have economic uncertainty in front of us coming out of this COVID-induced recovery, uh, the shutdowns uh, going into recovery, and some could argue 
argue that the Fed and the monetary stimulus is a game changer into how it reprices risk assets. That's most certainly accurate. Uh, some could argue that there are very few periods where risk assets do not perform well when there's all this liquidity sloshing around looking for a home. Uh, someone could argue there's almost $4 trillion of cash on the sideline looking to be optimized. All that's true. And so the point I would make is that we're, let's say we're sitting here at Dow 26 or 27,000, and a few months ago we were sitting here at Dow 18, 19, 20,000. There were arguments then someone could have made to be out of equities, and there were arguments then someone could have made to get in equities, and there are arguments now the same. And just like then, going forward, where we are now, going forward, then people will be able to say three months later, six months later, oh, I coulda, woulda, shoulda. And the coulda, woulda, shouldas are not going to be invalidated or invalidated based on the arguments that were made at the time. Those arguments are legitimate. The problem is that they're not conclusive because financial planning doesn't involve things that are themselves conclusive in the present moment. They only become conclusive with hindsight. This is a refresher on one of the most basic of basics in the investing world, that the whole reason one asset allocates and goes 60% in equities as opposed to 93%, or goes 40% as opposed to 20%, or goes 20 instead of 53, or whatever the numbers are and how they get set, based on one's view of the world, one's liquidity profile, one's tolerance for up and down movement, all of the factors that get baked in the asset allocation, that's the whole reason one does a plan. Plan. Because when you have a plan that allows for the risks and opportunities that are there at Dow 20,000, as well as the risks and opportunities that are there at Dow 30,000, you don't have to sit there and live your life trying to flip a coin as to what newsletter writer is correct when the Dow's at 20 or when the Dow's at 30, or what pundit on TV is right, or whatever headline on media is right. You actually have something more substantive that has optionality in the way it will treat your portfolio and how it will sustain your pursuit of financial goals. Now, when I think to the longer term issues that linger out in our economy and, and issues that I think will most certainly impact the way we are allocating client portfolios over time, and also, it's becoming one that more intelligently gets presented to me, too, by clients who have questions about it. There's always things that, um, that clients will ask about, some of which I think are old news, some of which I do not think are market impactful, some of which I think you know everyone knows about. Every now and then, someone brings something up that no one would know about, and those are kind of those events that you know always have the potential to become black swan events. But there is this area that has tremendous import, not only to us as investors, but to all citizens of the United States of America, and that is our debt status, our long-term debt trajectory. And yet this is the thing that I believe has to get through your mind. Saying the long-term debt of the United States is unsustainable. Our trajectory of growing our debt is unsustainable is totally unhelpful. It's, by the way, totally true as it goes. You hear people in Congress say it all the time. But from an investor or economic standpoint, the reality is that the um, lack of specificity when someone says the debt's going to blow up in our face, um, you know, we're leaving our kids a mess, it's unhelpful even though it's accurate, and, and I think it sort of creates this idea that there's this kind of point in time out there where all of a sudden you have this sort of like explosion, this kind of cataclysmic event and, and where all of a sudden we're living in like this alien dark world or something. And, and so then, because most people don't take that kind of sci-fi approach to the future debt implosion seriously, it causes them not to take the debt itself seriously. But see, I actually believe it is a big deal, 
And I think there are a few options out into the future. They're not real simple. It isn't like you just get a menu and you order one off the menu, as we've seen in Europe and, frankly, as we've seen in the United States. The people that come out and say, here's what the problem is and here's how it's going to go, they have an inevitable discrediting coming to them because these things are so complex, so untimable, so nuanced, have so many variances around them that there's no way to fully get that right and peg it. What we do know is that having what's getting close to $25 trillion national debt with one to two trillion being added to it, it's going to be more than that here in the COVID year, as I'm sure you know. That feels unsustainable to people because it is unsustainable. And I can say things like, well, we can keep doing it as long as the bond market lets us. And I can be right. But I don't think people know what this means. I don't think they have a kind of construct to think about what it means into the future. How do we, in fact, sort of deal with what we intuitively believe represents a tremendous cloud hanging over the American economy and the American country, for that matter? So what I will say to you is that there's the option that we grow our way out of it, you know, productivity, corporate profits, it generates higher revenue, and we just keep growing rapidly and, and get the right pro-growth policies, and then, and then through time, growth-oriented solutions enable us to kind of work our way down and manage it on the way. That's certainly been what a lot of people have hoped for for years. It most certainly was obtainable or doable, um, but... But I think most people have determined that's not going to happen, that we're not going to go down that path. Then the second option is that we cut our way out of it, just pure austerity, entitlement reform, budget discipline. Now, if you think growing your way out of it is unsustainable, then cutting your way out of it is laughable. There is no precedent for a country that takes well to politicians telling them we're cutting this benefit, we're raising these taxes, we're cutting this spending. Really, the only way even number one would work is in tandem with something like number two. And both number one and number two seem to be totally unsustainable, um, and, and at least at a level that would be necessary to fully, you know, uh, do, do what needs to be done. Now, now number three is that just in theory, we could just flat out cancel some of the debt or pursue debt forgiveness, just kind of default on our own debt. It's the worst of the options. Um, it would more or less mean we'd be cut off from debt markets into the future. If we weren't cut off, it would certainly mean that we'd be borrowing at ridiculously high prices. It would be destabilizing. It would be depressionary. And also you have to keep in mind that we do technically, you know, have this thing called the U.S. dollar, which is the reserve currency of the world. Um, so as Hamilton taught us in the late 18th century, the United States not making good on its debts has got to be considered not considerable. And, and uh, yet, in theory, that option's out there. Number four is what I would call the full-blown Japan option, which is basically the Fed buying the debt. There's varying degrees of what it could look like. So this makes it a little more complicated because there's sub-options under the Japanification option. Uh, this is, by the way, if I had to bet right now where I think we are headed, some version of a, a Japanification. Um, but... Enabling ongoing borrowing, which is what the Fed's doing now, is different than monetizing legacy debt. They could do one. They could do both. Um, I don't believe that they'll do neither, though. I, I, think, I think that that is uh, out there. And, and based on how it has gone in Japan and the unattractiveness of other options, I suspect some version of that is where we're headed. Uh, then, of course, you're hearing more and more about this concept of modern monetary theory. Most people don't really understand what it is. They think it's just simply some kind of magic thing where you print enough money. It's more complicated than that. The mechanics matter. The actual mechanisms matter. Um, there's a reason why what we're doing right now is not MMT, even though it, it, there's some similarities when a Fed's running massive balance sheets 
But again, um, the Fed is not monetizing that debt as long as they have the ability to sell the bonds they've bought back into the marketplace, right? They're not paying for the debt with permanent capital. And so they're, they're, they're impacting interest rates and they're impacting the ability to borrow and they're providing liquidity and they are serving as a buyer with money doesn't exist, but it is not the actual central bank buying the debt, which would be more uh, MMT-like. Um, so there are differences between the Japanification option and the MMT option. Uh, some might think that those differences are, um, you know, uh, very slight, but it, it's important to have the right categorization. So I guess what I would get to is rather than view some future where we have just kind of no access out of our ATM machines in a wasteland of, you know, um, of existence, I think that there are economic processes and outcomes that probably have nothing to do with a point in time, but become a kind of embedded reality, sometimes over many years. And that's how we need to be thinking about uh, the debt. The bad part comes either from inflation and they have not been successful, by the way, in trying to inflate away the debt or in deflation, which I think most of you listening know is my belief that they end up going a Japanification route and suppress growth to a point that the deflation ends up holding down. Um, our productivity, which A, adds to the debt because they're not generating the revenues necessary, uh, but B, b rewards one part of society, those with assets, and, and hurts uh, others. Um, to go down the route of, of debt forgiveness, that, that would take away uh, access to debt capital, that would be a decline in services the government could offer, potentially a decline in, in entitlements. Um, you know, there's political options that just aren't very sensible. Now, now is number one and number two still out there? It has to be in the list, okay, because it certainly could happen. If they could just wave a wand and, and implement a really radically pro-growth economic agenda and, and have consensus to get it done and then have this really aggressive cost-cutting endeavor over a decade, then, then I, I still, in, until some point in time where it is too late, it isn't too late. But I don't rule out one and two or a combination thereof because it can't be done. I rule it out because I think it won't be done, okay? So let me move forward from this. The new word that I have been using, I stole from my friend John Malden, Japanification. And there's another term that I think is, is accompanying this, but I didn't steal it from him. Um, I, I've been using it a lot, and it's called financialization. And this is important for investors because this is now we get to not one of the options for debt payoff, but we get to one of the consequences. And this is where I think it has impact to investors that we can see much of the impact in a positive way and yet impact to the society that is, has a negative connotation. And I want us to understand how both those things are true at once. Um, financialization is sort of... Uh, uh, a necessary consequence, probably not a desirable one by the Fed, but one they're willing to live with in the type of economy that the Fed is embarking upon. And uh, what I mean by financialization is, is that uh, rather than a spirit of productive economic behavior, a lot of decisions get made simply out of financial deck chair movement. Cheap money, heavy liquidity from you know zero interest rates, quantitative easing, that the engines of markets are not themselves. Companies maybe that shouldn't survive do. Companies end up not getting started or not making the investments in certain long-term projects. Um, decisions, uh, short-term versus long-term, surviving versus thriving, it's altered. There's distortion. And financial management ends up trumping operational performance. That's what I mean by financialization. And so just like the suppressed gro growth I described, uh, Japanification, um, this has a bad to it. Um, primarily, I think one of the great examples for stock market investors is you get companies that in a world of excess liquidity and low cost of capital decide to buy their competitors instead of beat their competitors. 
Uh, I'm not saying all M&A is bad. I think some M&A is really synergistic and really strategic. But my point being that the mentality of financialization is something different than productive and operative performance. And we all, as believers in free enterprise and believers in the radical capabilities of the human spirit, would rather see productive and operative performance than financial performance. Financial performance ought to flow out of operative performance, not be itself the end, the end unto itself, if you know what I mean. So as a basic rule of thought, the more excessive debt you have, um, the more Fed intervention, and the more Fed intervention, the more financialization. So the inverse of that, if you had less Fed intervention, I think you'd have more productive and operative performance. So if we got that outcome, I think the winners would be all of us, the whole society, more uh, you know, optimization in the economy, and shareholders do well with optimization. But without it, in the financialization model, the whole society doesn't benefit, but shareholders do. You follow me? This is sort of the dilemma that we're up against. Now, I'm not going to go invest based on what I do not believe is going to happen. I got to invest based on what I think is going to happen. And I, and, I, and I don't believe that there's any other option. But I do think it's important that we understand those distinctions. Okay, I'm going a bit long here, but I'm going to keep it going. The inflation, deflation discussion is intertwined with what I've been talking about. It has a lot to do with debt and most certainly with Fed intervention. But at its core, the kind of economic lesson that people have to understand is that Fed activities dealing with the supply of money cannot and do not impact the demand for money, which another way of saying it is the demand for credit. So by the Fed buying a whole lot of bonds with money that doesn't exist and depositing that excess on the balance sheets of banks um, as excess reserves, that doesn't get the money circulated in the, to the economy it increases money supply, but is basically held on shelves. And that cannot become inflationary without a velocity of the money. Velocity comes from greater demand for goods and services. Greater demand for goods and services comes from organic, healthy, operative, sound familiar, productive economic thought, economic aspiration, economic decision making. So you can get more money stock, but unless demand joins that supply, then you sit with asset prices inflating, but credit growth constricted because of a lack of organic demand, stuck in a cycle of deflation. Now, I'm not arrogant enough to say that there's no scenario by which the Fed putting this money out on the shelves does not ever get into the real economy, is that it simply can't be done. Um, I do believe that, okay? But I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm saying it hasn't been done. There's no precedent for it. Out of the uh, great financial crisis, it didn't happen. Out of Japan and Europe and United Kingdom, it hasn't happened. Now, I guess you have to look at this Main Street lending facility and say, does this have a real economy dynamic to it? Does the Fed intervening in this sense with a monetary tool end up creating a, a real economy tool that that actually stokes economic activity? Um, I, again, for that to turn into an inflationary phenomena, an awful lot of things have to happen. Um, and so we continue to monitor all of this, but land firmly on the on the side of history that what the Fed can do in increasing liquidity and stabilizing financial markets and being a lender of last resort in catastrophes, those are all things that do not play in to what they can't do, which is generate demand for goods and services in the economy. I got a big kick, by the way, out of a report I read this morning uh, from a major financial Wall Street firm where I used to be employed, 
that said they were starting to question if the Fed has abandoned its focus on financial market stability and has instead embraced a willingness to tolerate asset bubbles in the service of full employment goals. So I will just break the news for them. They have. Okay? Um, I think they have for decades. And I I don't think that they do that uh, unknowingly, unwillingly. I think that it's a willingness to tolerate asset bubbles because philosophically they believe that that option is better than the alternative, which would assure higher unemployment. And I don't happen to believe they're right. I do believe that they believe it. But I would be somewhat surprised at the idea that there are others not seeing through the tea leaves of the Greenspan, Bernanke, Yellen, Powell era that there is um, a prioritization that lends itself to the seriousness by which they take protecting employment via protecting asset markets via willingness to tolerate asset bubbles. This is a mentality in the central bank. Uh, It can be criticized. It can be criticized holistically or it can be criticized partially. I'd probably be in that camp, but I don't think there's any point in pretending it doesn't exist. There's a chart at DividendCafe.com today that shows 60 companies that have cut their dividend in the S&P 500 so far. And the reason I bring it up is I just want to reiterate before I move on that dividend growth is not something we have ever seen that can be done passively, that can be done by indexing, that can be done as set and forget that it requires active management because of cyclical changes in companies, because of cyclical changes in the economy, because of extrinsic circumstances. Um, So our commitment to continuing to grow the dividends from the companies that we buy on behalf of clients is a commitment that is not going away and is a commitment that we understand requires active participation. And as people relying on the income of, let's say, the S&P 500, or by the way, even the income of a dividend-oriented passive strategy that itself is very vulnerable because it's based on backward-looking understanding of dividends instead of forward-looking understanding. Um, The chart speaks for itself. A lot of conversation about small cap investing. I'm actually very sympathetic. Uh, We did a podcast with our whole investment committee a couple weeks ago. Um, I do agree with the historical reality that small cap has outperformed large cap. Companies of, let's call it, under $5 billion of market cap versus companies of a larger capitalization coming out of recessions. And I have a chart at Different Cafe showing that, um, you know, six months out after a market bottom, uh, whether it was 1982, 87, 92, that, you know, we look back over all these bear markets and the small cap sector had outperformed large cap by quite a, a, a good amount. Out. And and I think that's accurate, and I think there's reasons for it. It isn't just the historical coincidence of the calendar. But again, to make another point in opposition to a philosophy of passivity and a philosophy of indexing, we also have a chart that shows you that right now, 42% of the companies in the Russell 2000 the small cap index do not make money. They lose money. They are non-profit making enterprises. That doesn't mean the stock price is necessarily going lower. A bunch of them obviously will, but it does sim- very much mean that an index filled with companies that might average 10 to 20 percent that are non-profit making companies to be at a place that has oh, almost half um, suggest that you, there is no way to get passive exposure to small cap without buying a lot of good companies and a lot of bad companies on one basket. And we think that an active approach involves the potential for human fallibility, but at least provides some active judgment that can help discern where opportunity lies. Um, there is why I, I honestly think one of the most interesting charts we've ever done, Dividend Cafe, around market volatility, where we show the biggest down days of the last 100 years and the biggest up days. And I want people to understand just how unbelievably volatile this has been here through this COVID moment. Um, When you look to, if you just take out the Great Depression, financial crisis, Black Monday, then all you're left with is COVID. I mean, as far as like the top 25 biggest down days and 25 biggest up days, they've all come basically from either this COVID experience or the financial crisis or Great Depression. And then you have that one day of Black Monday, which still represents the biggest percentage down day in history. But the third worst day ever 
came on March 16th of this year, and <clears throat> it barely missed being the second worst day, which was the great crash of the Great Depression, and the other worst day, which was Black Monday, and then the sixth worst day just was four days before that, and then um, uh, you a few days before that, another one that made the top 25. And, and then you also, by the way, had two of the biggest up days in history through the COVID moment as that kind of violent upswing and downswing was taking place. So the extreme days speak for themselves. I think everybody knows that. I, I think that historical reminder is helpful to understand. But here's the part I'd, I'd say that's more relevant and, and maybe less um, severe. 33% of all days so far this year, the market's been up or down over 2%. So that kind of ongoing severe volatility may not be the 9% days and the 7% days. Those are brutal. Um, but even having a such a regular daily occurrence of up and down over 2% days is not only speaks to the just complete insanity of trying to trade and time one's way in and out, but also speaks to the challenges that are embedded in being a risk asset investor right now and the wisdom of having a plan. If that sounds like a theme, it's because it is. A theme of dividend growth, a plan of uh, behavioral um, commitment to the plan. These are the things that we think the moment right now is screaming for. Um, in terms of a couple parting thoughts, and we'll and we'll move on. Um, I am very committed right now to the idea of studying the economy throughout the recovery to get an idea where opportunity lies, where risk lies, what it's telling us, where the market's going. The market went up in advance of the economy beginning to turn because the market was pricing in ahead of time what it knew to be the case that uh, 30 million unemployed was a, a temporary consequence of the severe policy action and not a new normal. But how long airlines would be shut down, how long restaurants would be shut down, how long malls would be shut down, those things were somewhat unknown. And so now we can look at the charts and see, okay, daily travelers as registered by um, TSA traffic was down 99% and now it's down 83%. Okay, so that's a meaningful move, but it's still way down. So you get both things at once, much better, still bad. Open tables, reservation tracking in uh, an index of the major U.S. cities, some of which have really, really opened up, some of which have barely opened up. You see, again, down 100% in, in the peak COVID moment, now down something around 70%. So a lot of improvement, still a lot of work to do. The big number that people liked this week, retail sales and food services, that number obviously had just completely collapsed. Then it had a big rebound higher, about more than double what uh, consensus expectations were. And so, again, uh, this is the consumer category that you expect we're going to see improvement in. But then I put three, uh, two other charts at, at Dividend Cafe that are not airline, hotel, retail, restaurant, some of the kind of you know, more expected uh, categories of consumer activity. The Industrial Production Index, which dropped dramatically and has just picked up a tiny bit. The capacity utilization, the, the percent of capacity that we're running at, dropped from roughly 78% to 64%. Now it's ticked up to 65%. Both industrial production categories went way down and have just come up a little bit. And the point I want to make is that if you want to know how the economy is going to be doing in the middle of 2021, these are the departments that I would be studying. Business investment, capital expenditures, industrial production, and online resumption of the supply side of the economy. That's where you're going to see organic growth and sustainable health. There are obviously going to be fluctuations and concerns about the, the more traditional numbers, the unemployment number. 
matters because it's so integral to human dignity and human um, activity. And yet in terms of getting a feel for forward-looking market understandings, we're going to be following the business investment categories that go there with even more than the kind of retail-oriented consumer-driven data points. Um, And the politics and money side... I um, will just leave you with this. Re-elections uh, have been pretty much 100% correlated um, with uh, uh, for a first-term presidency for 100 years. With if there was a recession, they didn't get re-elected. Then they didn't get re-elected, and if there wasn't a recession, they did. How, uh, however, I will say this: that's not me making a prediction. President Trump won't get re-elected because I do believe that there's always the possibility of an outlier when the cause of the recession was unique around this COVID moment. And the fact that one would presume the GDP recovery will be surging dramatically at the time that voters are kind of formulating those opinions. So one can make an argument either way, that the recovery from this recession could end up being an opportunity for President Trump, and then the mere existence of all the financial hardship right now could be could seal his doom. I am sympathetic to the argument that history is clear, but I'm also sympathetic to the argument that this time could be different. It, 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 both sides have to be considered. Um, as far as all the ramifications of this whole entire presidential consideration, the election, and so forth, um, I am going to write a pretty significant white paper going into early July uh, that by mid-July we want to get out to you just to offer a lot of history and a lot of perspective um, so that people can uh, formulate the right perspective about the market, the economy, as we go into the November period. With that said, thank you all for bearing with this longer Dividend Cafe. I hope you got something out of it. We cover a lot of categories, particularly that recap of various options of the future debt. Um, all of these topics are near and dear to my heart. Um, but I welcome any questions you have. We're we're all here for you. Reach out to your advisor. And and, um, in the meantime, have a happy Father's Day weekend. And thank you for listening to. Thank you for reviewing. Thank you for sharing and forwarding and rating so highly your experience at either our YouTube or, 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 uh, or podcast of the Dividend Cafe.